Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire you to take action to be all you can be. Today we're going to go deep into the relationship between the environment, man's impact on the environment and the subsequent impact on man's collective psyche with my guest, with my guest Jan Rodder. Born and bred in Western Australia, Jan is a practicing phys- uh, psychotherapist who also volunteers her service to work with home- homeless people, whether in a park, public bench or in a local support centre. She's also been a consultant in Aboriginal sites, rock art and cultural research, as well as land restoration, wetland ecology and sustainability. Her underwater adventures have led to shipwreck archaeology and a personal fascination with marine ecosystems. Jan is also a founder member of the Wetlands Conservation Society, WA Coral Reef Association and Scientists Against Nuclear Arms. She recently delivered a a lecture at the Young Society of WA entitled A Psyche the Size of the Earth, which looked at the relationships and impact between our effects on the environment and then the human collective psyche. Jan, welcome to the show. Hi, Bryn. So, um, obviously in that uh, introduction, is a lot there about your connection with the land and ecology and etc cetera, etc cetera. where where did that come from for you is that from growing up in western australia with the great diverse land that we have can you talk some on that mm. yeah it was being in, you know thinking back into the hills here into an orchard and so that was lush and generative where we had a house cow and we used to play in it and we go out to, after that, lived in the country a little bit. And then um, when we moved to Frio, we had a shack on the beach, which isn't here anymore. Yeah. Um, Whereabouts was it? Well, it's probably 15 minutes from here at Coogee. And in the end, they had to be knocked down because places weren't allowed to be there. It was a nature reserve. Um, it, but in the end, a storm got all of the huts, which was bittersweet. So we grew up looking out at the islands and you know, looking at the sea, being in the sea, being in the sand. And we had everything there. It was the most basic, simple, beautiful wooden house, wooden shack. That's all it was, a hut. Yeah. Yeah. Super. What was it, what was it like growing up in your childhood in, in, in Western Australia? Um, what do you, besides the connection and looking out across the ocean, what other things do you remember about it? Um, well, we had stables at the back of our house in Frio where we used to play and of course they wouldn't exist any, here anymore because of the value of real estate. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember a lot of bush. We used to play in the bush. We used to um, go down to the river to swim and go through the bush. I can still remember the prickles on my feet from these, you know, sort of oak leaf sort of banks here that are there. Um, and it was beautiful. But then they all got smashed down for the tennis courts that are there now. Um, there were vacant blocks where we used to play in with the grass trees and the zamia palms and the mary trees. It was pretty well everywhere that we could go and roam. Roam. So there was a lot of freedom. There was. Superb. So as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you're a psychotherapist. Um, how did how were you drawn to that, and and why why has that been a chosen career for you? I started off teaching uh, a long time ago. Then I wanted to study further, uh, deeper, and so I went back and uh, did environmental science and ecology, and through that I became involved in um, those conservation groups that you read out at the beginning. And and I went to a lot of meetings where there was industry based. This is talking about thirty years ago, right? Um, and and so all these differing points of view. Whereas to me, it just seems so self evident that here's this beautiful nature, and it's ours to look after. And it's a real interesting thing to then try and have the language to communicate with these other values that are on. And of course, it's how it's been and and is today and and so I studied mediation then to try and bring that further into play and um, it wasn't until some time later it comes on an actually different story where yeah. uh, how, how I got to be and I was interested in you know the, the human human nature and a different 
ways of being in the world and the different ways that we view things. And that came from seeing how people interacted with nature yeah, primarily. Yeah, and then later uh, through that, um, also seeing on another world at the more private level, other people who had lost their jobs and who fell into deep depression and then the right. physical, even inherited condition rather, threw them into despair and, and, and how there was this, uh, something that happened back in the childhood um, often or other trauma in their life. So uh, that was a, I still have more to learn. Of course, I'll still have more to learn until I mm. die. Yes. But that was really what put me on this path. And, right. of course, finding out about myself. All right, so there's a bit of self-discovery in oh, there as absolutely. well. absolutely. All right. And what, what have you learned about Jan on this journey so far? <laughs> oh, I've you went learned... right into that question. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready for that one. I, in general, I yeah. say I've learned um, a lot about my shadows. I'm still learning about my personal complexes and how that has set me up uh, wisely or unwisely mm. in life and what can I do about them. And the archetypes which um, I have grown along with through my family, through my culture, and through the nation that I've grown to live, which would be different from yours. Yes. You know, for any of us, a different country and time in which we're born. And so discerning between what I felt I should pick up from that and what is truly me to right. pick up on that. So what... Uh, so what sort of um, is your focus at the moment with, with your psychotherapy work? Is there any particular niche of client that you work with? Um, I'm a person who uh, has more than one iron in the fire at once. Yeah. So I um, very much um, are drawn to working with people who... Um, homeless is the general name, but it's also people who whose luck has run out. They don't need to be homeless for that. So yes, yes, I've been there today and yesterday, uh, and but it's also uh, with people who are are looking about into their habits um, and anything that's like a, a cognitive dissonance within themselves. Can you like, explain what you mean by cognitive uh, dissonance? Oh, okay. Well, a, a cognitive dissonance is when something that we kind of know at one level and it's jarring inside us, but we do it anyway. One might be um, loving dogs and eating sheep. And so we might know if we, when we, we look with dogs more frequently than we are with a sheep or a lamb. But when you see children with a lamb more so than a sheep because young things are more playful, more interactive. And then ask them, would they ever like to eat that? You know, undoubtedly they'd say, no, I would never like to eat that. And yet we've grown up conditioned that this is what you do, this is normal. So it's like that a child knows and has that this, this shudder, and right. then, but, but it gets glossed over in life. So right. we live on these two different planes. Um, where it becomes a normal right cool um so as i said in the introduction you you recently talked gave a talk about um the a psyche the size of the earth at the young society um can you give us give the listeners a, a brief insight into what you were covering in that um lecture and how you came about bringing it together ah oh, how did i come about bring it together uh I, I'd been along to a lot of lectures and, and loved them at the Young Society and for me there was a, a, a lack, of, a, a, an absence of things to do with the natural world and to do with the antiquity of Australia and with right. all of their Aboriginality here and all of the plant forms and animal forms and geological forms um, and we were bringing in a lot of research from overseas which is not uncommon anywhere and, and so for me there was that absence of the Australian aspect um, but also at the time uh, you know uh, un, uh, unbeknownst to me uh, I was going to do this but it ha I, I put the idea forward to the committee at the time when I had been arrested uh, and I'd been arrested because of a a lot of bushland and wetlands and Aboriginal lands that were going to be desecrated for a road 
there's a lot of conjecture about the road, uh, but for 30 years we had been campaigning very strongly against the road going through because it was planned when I was three years old um, and it was when swamps and lakes were rubbish tips. Right. And, and things are valued differently now, but that same plan, that same line on the map had gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd been to um, the court cases over the time. One was a Supreme Court about this road and the other values. The other one was the Federal Court. And I was listening to every word and I was aghast at the language used in the courtrooms compared to what happens on the land, like when all these trees are knocked down that take 130 years for a a roost, a nesting site for these red-tailed cockatoos or white-tailed black cockatoos to form, they're knocked down. Oh, well, where's the family of these going to go? Or the booble cows or the barn owls that nest in these hollows? They have to have this and this and this and this to eat and, and to rest in, to roost in. Oh, well, we've got a place over there that they'll go to. You know, it's sort of 90 kilometres away. Oh, really? Who's, who's, going to, who's going to direct those animals there? And, oh, we, we're going to plant more trees over there. Well, they'll be ready in 30 years. What happens now? And the kind of food sources you're talking about, um, that is not what their needs are. Hmm. So there was this real difference in the in the kinds of thinking that goes on in the in the legal side to what happens on the land, and, and so that was it. I thought there's done all done a lot over these years to try, and uh, you know you write letters, you do all the rational things. I thought that's it, you know. Um, so I did something that was arrestable. What did you do? <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, well, with another, um, I decided to um, jump over quite a few high fences and we did know there was a guard dog on at night too. Yeah. And so in the dark we got over um, the fences and locked on to uh, Coro, on to a bulldozer and me onto the excavator. But I can tell you, even though I knew that it was a temporary thing, it, it felt, I felt so resolute being there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, especially after, you know, just knowing what's gone on with all these years. Yeah. Yeah. How did that resolution fail in you? Um, I didn't want to move. And when the time did come, uh, when they had to dismantle the machine to take me off some hours later, um, because I refused to get off myself, yeah. I, I was shattered. And I, I just didn't want to leave because I knew that the machines would be out devastating again. And they did. Someone filmed where um, that afternoon these trees were knocked down and a family of three uh, they owls, um, tawny frogmouth owls, uh, normally they would not fly in the day. This was in the afternoon. And they were blasted out of their home when they were fast asleep. And the next day one of them was found dead, one of the young ones. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you just know that's a temporary thing. But it was better for me to have done something rather than nothing mm. and then you know from there a lot more people got arrested as well following the days on from that right so it, we like to think held things up a little bit caused a bit of buggeration yeah yeah so how did that then lead to the the talk you did um well i never mentioned that in the talk instead i did a good six months of research for it and i uh, of course, looked at, at the state of the world now, and, um, mm. and that carries on from all the ecological well, work I studied. F- what was the focus of the research? Uh huh. Um, the importance of nature on our lives and how we're living artificial lives in general, mm. um, and how does that affect us inside? And Really, um, the, as Clive Hamilton, an ethics professor of Australia, said, uh, somewhere in Australia, said, um, the greatest tragedy is the absence of a sense of tragedy that this is happening. And so right. it's like the double standards that we're living, carrying on life as usual, business as usual. Yeah. And so Which what is this saying about us? Which sort of goes back to that cognitive us? dissonance. Yeah. 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 Sorry, you were saying? 
Yeah. Um, and, and then, okay, so, so I looked at the effects on our psyche. I looked at the history of, ev of the evolution of our psyche, if it can be called that. And um, then I presented some possibilities of ways through this. Mm. So what were some of the things that you found? What were some of the ways through it? Uh, well, as Jung says too, and there's a lot of... Um, I mean, really, wouldn't it be wonderful to have something mass that we could change a lot of things all at once? But it seems not to be that way. That comes from the individual making changes toward with a spirituality content and with a connection toward a cosmic um, aspect toward uh, our, the people around us, the nature around us, and of course to ourself, our true self. Mm stuff that seems easy enough and you think yes yes but collectively we're not doing it why is it you believe that we have lost our connect connection with the land through time um the my research found that uh, it started well i compared it with the um with first nation people great place to start where it, it just happens through the very essence of being this connection with their life depended on nature and they knew it even the astronomy they knew mm. when the food would be available through the stars through the positioning um, and and then after that um, religion um, seemed to come and take away um, the myths of those of those stories they took away um, the 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 sacredness of the land and the goddesses and the feminine aspect were taken uh, to the male aspect and that got further removed from the land to eventually be one mm. um, male god in the sky. Right, so there's a religious impact. Yeah. Was it not also a... the, the rise of the industrialised age? Yeah. Or and was that... that a manifestation, oh. further manifestation of a move towards a male? <laughs> Yeah, you've yeah. got it there, and that also part of the industrial and the agricultural revolution. And the um, industrial brought about the petroleum age, and the petroleum age brought about the plastics and the dyes, um, you know, that are making a huge difference on the rivers and the uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, you know, the things that are in micro and nanoparticles around, and to the sounds that are uh, making a difference to the whales so that they become stranded. You know, yeah, that's the drilling for gas for our. Petroleum, petroleum is gas included. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the scientific era uh, heralded that, and that took away again, you know, the, the essence of nature because instead things wanted to be controlled and brought into laboratories so that the wholeness, in most cases, was taken away and things were separated. And then with that became the the disciplines, you know, the the mathematical discipline and the sub-disciplines within that, the science, the economics, instead of talking together. Hmm. Hmm. You're sort of losing the wholeness of the picture. Hmm. Um, it, I find it interesting because on one level I feel like we've, like I said, lost our, lost our connection with, our la with the land. But then on another level we've lost our, I feel like we lose our, intuition as well which is almost like a connection to something bigger than us not necessarily the land but something you know ethereal or whatever so it leaves us in this very isolated and lost place not connected to land not connected to our, our greater sense of being um d do you agree with that and and how do you think we've got ourselves there as well well we get ourselves the way that way through being seduced by the other, seduced by the comforts, which came about with the industrial um, and, and the petroleum age, let's face it, you know, we love the vacuum cleaner that scoops up things, we don't have to sweep. Mm. Um, so we don't go out and gather the reeds to make the straw broom mm. anymore. Um, how did we get away from it? In agriculture, and tell me if I'm not answering your question specifically, but you know, people became static, they stopped the hunting, they stopped becoming aware of the animals, they were herded, the animals became trapped. And, and, and a lot of 
people would think that agriculture is about the land and is about nature, well, perhaps it is relatively speaking to city life, but it was another beginning that started herding people toward domesticity as well. Mm. And, you know, it has so many advantages as well, it's, it's no doubt. But each at each step, we became more distant from nature. And say, let's talk about, for now, petroleum. And so the lights are on at night, we don't look at the stars anymore. You know, we barely go out. So we've lost our sense of navigation, our sense of instinct, our sense of north, south, east or west. Mm. in a lot of cases. Particularly when we can pull a phone out and Google and tell us where to go. There it is. There it is. There it is. So what impact does this have on our unconscious and, and then our collective unconscious if we were going to yeah. you know, follow the Carl Jung part of this? Okay. Um, well, Carl Jung began the... Uh, uh, the discourse you say by thinking that when um, the, the the goddesses and the animals, all those that the, the pagan things were banished from religion, they were pushed down, pushed down, you know, into the underworld and into the unconscious, and and we are sort of conditioned to fear that. So we not only fear our unconscious, we fear things to do with the animals, we fear things to do with anything that's not whatever our religion was mm. was was given to us. And and so with that unconscious, things have been, in the unconscious, things have been repressed. And uh, again, with repression, you know, things get acted out in ways that are camouflaged. And it could be considered as how we are doing things today, is because of this this gap, this emptiness, this lack, and also because our own masculine and feminine, of which we each have both sides, the healthy masculine and the healthy feminine, are not functioning well. Mm. So we've got this gap for that, and we are filling it with anything, filling it with consuming filling it with noise, filling it with, I think you know what I mean, just yeah. filling it. and Stimulation of any... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, another Jungian woman, Marion Woodman, talks about the addict and how the addict does not respect itself, its matter. How can we, and we are consumer addicts, societal addicts, respect um, the matter of the earth and so we've got an absence of um, a sense of pres self-preservation hmm. much and, like a cancer yeah and that's our arrogant consumerism as she mentioned hmm. and then what how what do you see in terms of the future and what needs to be done what can be done we can't we can't all go back because that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So what does the future look yeah. like? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, if the old model didn't work, we had to bring something old with something new. And as James Hollis, another Jungian, says, you know, to have our connections with some of the which I mentioned earlier, you know, connections with. Um, the cosmos, connections with our ancestors, connections with um, nature and with ourselves, ourself, mm. each of that. And uh, I guess to perhaps explain a little more, and going back to one of your earlier questions, Brent, was um, how did we get to be like this? And uh, again, another Jungian, Stephen Foster, he likened it to because we are a very young species well regardless of our age in our evolution our whole psychic evolution our separation from nature as he suggests gave us this um was a traumatic experience as any child with a, a, an early childhood trauma impacts on their lives and how they often respond is how he thinks we are responding now it's like We've um, got a wounded self, 
and we're protecting it by not relating to what's outside. Right. And so that's not relating to the nature. It's by tuning out the noises. It's by screening out the wind, the sun. It's by paving over um, everything so we don't feel the bare earth under our feet anymore. It's, it's by shutting nature out, not relating, and not relating to where does our waste go, and so on. So we've always got this, um, I can't see you type thing when you know we're ignoring things. With also, as you said earlier on, with this um, almost like this repressed fear, because it's very interesting when you you see people go, I don't know, to the beach or or go into nature that, and they don't normally go. There's, there's this incredible sense of fear around people. They're very nervous. You know, I'm not going to go more than knee deep in the ocean. Or else I'm going to get eaten by sharks. Well, you'd be pretty bloody unlucky if you were. <laughs> And and also, you know, you walk into the bush, oh, all the snakes and spiders are out to get me. No, no, they're not. They they want to go about their own business and they don't want anything to do with you, I imagine, unless you accidentally happen to step on them. Exactly. And let's face it, if I stepped on you, you'd ouch and probably kick me. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We've got this, how it now plays out in terms of there's two parts of that. I can't see you like yeah. a child, like yeah. you say. And then there's this repressed... Um, uh, the more you repress stuff the more you become fearful of it and it's interesting that as you as you know I, I read a lot about um, different habits and behaviours that make people successful and what do successful people do and that's part and parcel of why I do the podcast because I like to dig into what goes on and by and large one of the most success one of the habits that most successful people do is they go for a walk in nature and it's not meditation because meditation is meditation and a walk in nature is walking meditation. People say, and previous guest, Hindu monk Dandapani said, no, don't confuse a walk in nature with meditation because walk in nature is walk in nature. But both of them have merit. Both of them do something, whether there's a grounding effect or something like that. And, you know, I, one of the things I enjoy about living in Western Australia, and I say this to a lot of my friends, is back in England and what have you is um, you know, I'm fortunate to own four wheel drive it doesn't and that's a purposeful purchase it doesn't take me more than an hour an hour and a half before I'm around no one and it's freaking awesome because of it I don't have to go too far and there's no signs of life and it's great and there isn't all that energetic clutter and stuff like that and then with that you know if you can go and spend some time and you know Maybe spend a night out in nature, you know, whatever. You know, obviously in a designated camp spot, um, or maybe not. Um, but then when you come back to, um, you know, you come back into metropolitan Perth, and let's face it, there's only two point three million people live here. There's not that many compared to the sixty five million I had in England. But you come back and it feels different. You can feel that energetic clutter, and it's been nice to connect with nature. You know, things that were important before are not so important, and things that are weren't previously suddenly become and you just and I personally feel different between the two and then I get to a point where it's like oh it's time to go camping um what we're we doing this weekend I think it's time to go camping I mean I spend a lot of time in the ocean as well which is another place where you're not close to people but I think there is something in there about being in nature away from people being connected to it um, that has so many soporific benefit, beneficial effects. What, what are your thoughts? Unquestionably, I <laughs> it's described it beautifully. And research shows over and over again in different ways. It confirms what you were saying, that cortisol levels go down, inflammation markers mm. go down, that's pain as well. Yeah? Yeah. And when, I mean, it's also known that when we see water, and I would like to think uh, abs open spaces is in that realm as well we we it calms us it soothes us mm. and uh i don't it know extends if, your perspective it, not yes. just visually yeah but beyond that it takes us, me away from the human realm as well into other species because look in the suburbs that's pretty much wherever we look there's evidence of human isn't there yes and whether it's cats or dogs that's all human based for human reasons as well. Yes. And I was just out last week um, on this station where I go to work sometimes and um, it's just me 
uh, fought in 100,000 hectares, which is pretty big. Yeah. And um, there's no shots around. The nearest neighbour is 20 kilometres away. Um, and as I'm driving there, I'd love to say walking or riding a bike there, but I drove. And mm. I notice how my heart just opens the, as I move away from the city. Mm. And I also know that when I come back toward the city, oh, I get this different feeling again. And um, like you talked about camping years ago, I, you know, like a lot of people love camping. And I used to notice people that say, oh, out other people camping nearby and they say, oh, isn't this wonderful? Why don't we do this more often? Hmm. And I understood that well. And of course, living in a little basic beach shack, I decided to live a little bit like I'm camping. You know, like even the uh, wire toast cooker over the gas stove. And that's different from having an electric toaster on where you can yes. do 14 things at once and your toast not burn. Yes. <laughs> and so being it, it's like standing, it's being very present while your toast is cooking. Yes. And mind you, I do have other options or so, but um, it's great to do those things. I like having a place outside for a fire in the fire when we're allowed to have fires. Um, I, I like to have inside outside as well. And I, yeah, I like to have see the stars at night and have a shower outside. It's pretty lovely. Mm. Um, and for people who... And, and let's face it, there's a huge amount of have to be in high-rise buildings, and a lot of people love it. It's not for me. Um, it's great to be able to run outside the kitchen and pick herbs for cooking or something from the garden, uh, for just a couple of minutes or seconds away. Mm. But not everyone has that luxury. But, it, it, I mean, it, it does make an enormous difference to our psyches. Um, but people who have not had nature early in their lives, well, did you have nature early in your life, for example? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I always played in the garden. Then in 43, we obviously didn't have internet. We only had three channels on the TV. Most of the time it was rubbish. Um, yeah, we used to play in the garden a lot and used to ride our bikes around. Um, it wasn't nature like you had. Um, we did later move to a farm when I was 15, 16. And do you think that made an impression on you? Very much so. I felt very at home. And see, that's an important part in whatever stage in our life that's an impressionable age for you and it's carried forward with you and you still find it um, important. Mm. Mm. Interesting too what you said earlier about uh, being an hour to get away from and into a wider open spaces here. Um, even 30 years ago, you just need to go 20 minutes away. Yeah. And the street directories before Google Maps was about a centimetre thick, and you know how thick they are now because that's a destruction of um, urban land for the new houses that have to come. Sure, we've got population, it's a world problem, and people think West Australia, Australia is underpopulated. Um, Perhaps so, but we need to look at our carrying capacity just like any ecological system needs to. Do we have the water? You know, we've had to have desalinisation and that brings problems to the ocean with the extra salt. Uh, what about the groundwater levels? That's a problem for the wetlands and the migratory birds that come from Siberia and the resident water birds as well. What about the waste disposal we've, oh, and the sewage? All this carrying capacity and okay, we like to think that technology can fix it. It's a damned hard answer, the population one. Yeah, yeah. But I guess I guess the, your particular focus is how does this affect our individual and collective consciousness and how we're all bit by bit slowly moving, have been moving towards that. Oh, we can't see this, so it's not really happening. Denial part. And then having that fear, pushing that fear down. So yeah. when you do go on that camping holiday, it's like, ooh, it takes you a while to settle down and enjoy it because yeah. it's a fearful experience. Yeah. And it's a withdrawal as well, isn't it? Like someone drawing from cigarettes or, or caffeine. Mm. You know? A lot of people do take time to settle into it. Yes, different state. So with your um, work with homeless people as well, um, what... What do you see in terms of their interaction with um, 
with, with nature and the outdoors? Oh, you don't know how dear to this, my heart this is. Well, maybe you can guess. Um, it's not what I would like it to be, but yeah. that's me. Um, so I need to step back from that. In my, the people who I see, their needs are crisis oriented. And then we do go into longer stories. And I always ask them about their childhood connections with nature as well, and if their eyes light up, and you know, some do, some don't, um, because some have been urban, you know, raised. Mm. Um, and there are those who sleep out, and those who who aren't homeless, who I see, um, and they are city dwellers often. Um, there's water around, there's the wharf, there's the river, there's the ocean. That's walking distance for these people and uh, I try and encourage that but um, it's not a priority for them. I I would love to uh, be able to take people, I have on occasion, but with the organisation I'm with they say, no, it's too difficult for this, this and this reason. And I might add, uh, again going back to something you said earlier, how oh, we might think the snakes and the spiders will bite us and the sharks yeah. and so on, that even to take people out for insurance, the rate, the insurance premium goes up a lot if you yeah. just say we're going on a nature walk. So again, it's that fearful aspect and it's a high risk. In well, that's area. just um, adding to it. Systematically reinforcing this idea of fearfulness and risk totally. and, and, and yeah. worry. Yeah, and, and wouldn't another way be... Anxiety. Great? Exactly. And, okay, so how else might we deal with this? Well, okay, let's say reptiles, for example, if we're going out in the bush, the seasons are when it's warm, you know. And, okay, what can we do? Well, you wear shoes, you tread heavily, you keep your ankles covered and you don't put your hands under logs and so on. And, okay, what happens if you do? Well, you've done your first, first aid training. You've got your bandages with you and you hope you don't ever need yes. them. But you take those precautions. You take responsibility mm. for it. Yeah, at least you're doing something sensible. Something proactive. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's interesting listening to you there because um a couple of weeks ago i had a retired psychologist on on the podcast who was very um clear and blunt about his views on psychiatric meds and things like that and how it keeps people in a very frazzled um state of mind and that set against i saw a funny little video floating around on on facebook or something a while ago where it was suggesting that there's this new wonder drug called nature and you go and get some nature and it might cause spontaneous happiness and smiling and you know but be careful because there are things in nature as well how much do you think if um we were to prescribe nature that's a random question but how much do we think we could cure or not cure or reduce some of the um, larger and larger um, psychological, mental health issues that we seem to be seeing as a, um, on a rise? I'm so glad you said that because uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and even in New Zealand, uh, doctors have a green prescription. Have you heard of that? No. Mm-hmm. They'll write out, go for a walk in the bush or in what they call it, tramping, um, go yeah. out into green spaces and mm. that will add to your feeling of wellness. You know? So, yeah, there's, there's no doubt of that. I suppose it doesn't help big pharma though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> that you've always got to look at the money trail, don't you? You know, on any drive, and that's what's behind it. Indeed. When you hear doctors who are not adhering to that but are seeing the bigger picture, fantastic, who can steer away from the pharma trail. Yeah. Yeah, when there are other, you know, great things around, yeah, to prescribe that and get almost instant happiness well who wouldn't you know yeah, okay, and sure. with that once we develop an affinity with certain trees or certain wetlands or certain even a frog or a turtle you get to want to protect it and you want to get to want to protect its habitat and its food source mm. so without that affinity that kinship we don't know what to protect Yes. So it's about uh, even like an identity. I mean, Aboriginal people grew up here with a totem, an animal or, or so that connected them and, and watch out for this. What do mm. we have? 
look at landmarks today. People say, oh, where, where, how do I get to Suns? Oh, yes, just go round that McDonald's sign and go past that BP station. The landmarks aren't the hills anymore. They're not the rivers. They're not the, the, the hills, the slopes. You know what I mean? Yes. The, the man-made buildings and the landforms have been homogenised. It's very true. Very true. Hmm. And don't know where you've been uh, driving lately, but what comes to mind is even as the roads out away from the city are being widened, or again, the tops of the hills are just being sculpted so that trucks can go faster and smoother. The curves from old country roads are being straightened. And so even what they mm. might have seen as, uh, oh, isn't that nice? Not nice for trucks. Trucks are speed. Speed is money, you know, uh, efficiency. That's, again, and uh, going along the railway uh, line, you know, a big, fantastic uh, urban railway line uh, up in the northern suburbs, su suburbs that weren't there when I was even even 30 years ago they went there and can identify where I am because it's all uniform yes yeah one of the nicest things about coming to Western Australia from England was uh, I'm not great with directions but it was easy to work out where what um, either west or east was because it had a big piece of blue note there. yeah and the hills to the east yes indeed so for somebody listening to this, um, what what can they do to start to reconnect their psyche back to nature? Oh, a lot of things. Um, for people who uh, are urban or busy, they see there's different needs. That's a thing. For mm. people who are, say, busy or urban is to look for a local park, uh, look for a local little bit of open space, something they can go toward either often and get to know, get to know something over the different seasons, over the different times of day that mm. all have something different to offer and then to notice how they're feeling when they're there and when they've come back from there as you were saying when you were go camping and how long the feelings last. Because mm. then we're usually walking which is that beautiful dose of exercise as well that's pumping different things around inside of um so there's that um going around but and then it's looking to see as i see it what its lifespan is what kind of protection does it have who owns this land you know whether it's a government land or or not and it doesn't need some assistance because involvement in caring for something can make a difference as well. Hmm. Um, and then there's the big other, there's just so many things, Bryn. I'm not quite sure where to start with that. For instance, I love going down onto the river. Um, the season's just coming to an end now of the breeding season of the little fairy terns, also down at the port here. Um, and they're just this little tiniest fairy terns and they breed and they can breed on anything such as an airstrip, just rubble and yet they're being turned into bitumen so a group of you know, people have worked together and got fencing and signs involved so you watch the uh, fairy tern come into its mate sitting on a nest and Brent got a fish for there you know and they can recognize each other's chirp their voice recognition and when their baby hatches um, there's voice recognition and so it's when you experience these things and, and interesting well what are they eating how how good is their fish supply and so you get to see the food chain yes so you see you don't just see a bird in nature you get to enjoy their life and lifespan and how it works as yeah, well what its needs are mm. Mm. and i like that set against also watching seasons come and go and what is the effect it has on maybe just the park around you yeah used to be quite stark in England, you know, you'd have leaves and then you wouldn't have leaves <laughs> and the leaves would go brown and then they'd fall and then they'd be bare and then they'd be shoots. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, another interesting part is James Hillman, who is a, 
renegade in a lot of the psychotherapy. He wrote a book with a, another man who it was called A Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that piqued my interest enormously. And then I thought about, the, yes, well, he's, you know, he's correct there, but, I mean, let's talk about A Hundred Years of Engineering and A Hundred Years of Medicine, A Hundred Years of, you know, on and on it goes and the world's getting worse. Mm. So that helped me, again, step back from it. But it was some of his points were that if we engage um, overly with a person's um, inner, inner needs, we're not looking at the bigger connections. And, right. And how can we get anywhere when we're only looking at our own inner needs? Yes, because it, it, become, it can become quite myopic. Very much. And, yeah. and further, he says, uh, how about that a person, and in, in psychotherapeutic terms, they're called a patient. He says a patient can be seen as being like a victim, but treat them as a citizen first, you know, so they can get to solve and find solutions to the bigger picture as well and have this participation. And then that stems back to the uh, First Nations. They had participation in things in a lot of areas. Yes. Superb. Um, so what are some of the projects you'll be working on over the, in, in the near term future? I hope to further develop these workshops which I have and I'd like to have them available online yeah. and, uh, one, and in, in personal workshops. But, uh, and so what are those workshops focused uh, on? Well, I'd like them to be on the, um, um, sort of beyond the global gloom. Uh, right. What do you mean by the global gloom? Oh, it's what like, we've been taught. Well, right, the, the world's to going it. to shit. We're pulling all the oil out. We're decimated. And, well, yeah. also, did you hear just last week it was about the Arctic seas now? And they have not had these 60 uh, hours of zero degrees at this time of year. Right, yeah. It's open sea where there used to be thick ice. And so the cold shafts of, air have been go of water have been going down and you know, you know how it's been so cold in uh, places in Europe as well. Uh, that is enormous difference too. And the mm. shelves down on Antarctica as well. And there are so many subtle differences with the insects and with the um, things that we don't necessarily see, you know, as the, uh, in, in the oceans, the, the life, the, the plankton and how that makes a difference to the other food chains. So, yeah, the world is... Uh, yeah, gloomy. Uh, yeah, and we're going on like it's not. Mm. So the first so thing... So this is the focus of your Yeah, one, one is like to actually... First one is about the Negrito, actually, in the blackness, the doom, like looking at this existential crisis, if people ever get to calling it like that. Um, the, the, the darkening, the gathering of the darkness... Sounds weird, doesn't it? It's a beautiful sunny day out there and you and I have got food in the fridge and, you know, we've got a good life. And we're not immediately threatened as we see it. So this, the first stage, it's going to be four, a series, a series of four. And the first one is looking at these feelings of sorrow and sadness. And I've mentioned oh, some, but I haven't talked about how it's had me feel too much, how, how the development has happened so much around here. And in my life, but you're a visitor and compared to a visitor, sorry, you know, compared to um, how many years have you been here? Coming out to eight. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is gorgeous here compared to places that are more built up, isn't it? But yes. yeah, and, and I acknowledge that. Uh, having seen the difference also so rapidly to get to this stage now, I've got a lot of sorrow about what I see. And, of course, I felt enormous sorrow in the road, the destruction of those wetlands and trees. Yes. And not just there, but what that represents globally. You know, when we have palm oil, for instance, you know, the orangutan hones and on it goes. Yeah. A lot of deep sorrow and the ongoing effects of that. But where does it go? Do, Do we think, just pass it off? Do you think that is probably because acknowledging where we are will bring about great sorrow and we're increasingly at an age where we don't sit well with negative emotions or painful emotions do you think that maybe is 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 almost like the gate that shut that's stopping us from actually acknowledging what's going on and what we need to do uh, very much that's the way it is, isn't it? And we know, mm. as you mentioned, the pharma industry, all the advertisements tell us not to feel pain. But as uh, 
I wish I could recall her name now, but she said, if we don't want pain and we don't want these uh, feelings of worry, we're wishing the life of a dead person. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's like when we lose somebody dear to us, um, if we don't grieve, it comes up in other ways. Yes. And, and it is not grief forever. It moves. And it's up to us to let things move. So, yeah. The same with our relationship with the environment very much and the sorrows and the losses and there's a lot of names for these things too that are emerging now in the psychological world eco anxiety eco nostalgia eco paralysis um eco akarami complex which comes after akarami after the people who experienced the hiroshima and nagasaki bombings akarami is a feeling that was coined that they lived with and then as robert lifton as um, well published psychologist wrote that he believes Akarami complex is a global dread that is in our unconscious now now yes. how many people can you sit and talk about this with you know like oh, yeah. eyes glaze over or people change the subject and so to have because it is uncomfortable it is because deep down they know it's right <laughs> Big down in our right. Yes, and uh, yeah, it's fraught, isn't it? Like it is. And so to to have a space, a safe space, that containing that is very important. Mm. And a lot of people think, oh, well, that's wallowing. No, it's not about wallowing, and it's not about having to find an answer there. And then it's not about a five step point plan. You know, yeah. we're going to do this, and it's not about um, just getting heroic hope or false hope either. Yes, none of that. It's about giving it time and space, facing the darkness, and 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 having language for it, having expression for it, using symbols and listening to our dreams as yes. well. And then that's not the only stage. As I said, that's the first of all. I was going four. to say. <laughs> it's I don't so, know if I want to come for four weeks <laughs> No, you wouldn't want to no. have that. That <laughs> sounds grim, doesn't it? Um, and, uh, and there's laughter and there's all sorts of yeah. things in there too because it's all a part of the same thing. And then where else do the workshops go yeah, from there? After that, then there's a, like shining a light on um, how we're living our lives and how we're thinking about things, how we're feeling about things, and then moving on to the third stage. So I'm going through this quickly now is about looking at the myths that we've been living by, which again you talked of, or not mm. in those words, earlier. This sort of culture that we have, that has been gathering for us, and we assume this is okay because it's been encouraged by all the media, it's been encouraged the by... Societal norms. Yeah. The programs that we take on board, the stories we hear from the yes. media, etc., yes. etc. Et and, and a lot of us don't question it, or if we do, we think, oh, what now? And so it's looking at these and seeing okay what were their merits and what were their weaknesses as everything has and um, how can we turn them around what new myths can we create what what stories can we create what kind of heroes what kind of symbols um, and all that is there. I mean you know look at renewable energy for a start look at forms of transport look at these different kinds of living that we can have which do involve community and at the same time that's for us people who are haves, let's say, where you're not affected by sea level rising just yet. People are, as we know, you know, the hurricanes. People are moving from their homes right now, north of Australia and in Kiribati. They're really worried as their islands are getting smaller and smaller with the sea levels rising. All that's refugee, you know, status as well, imminent. And so what kind of citizens or people or community can we be with that? Hmm. And it's a little bit, I mean, could perhaps liken it to being with someone who has a terrible illness and it's very easy to avoid yes. someone's illness or someone dying if we're not, uh, what's the word, familiar or willing. And we've all got our own dying that we inevitably have to do. Yes. And how often can we talk about that too? Oh, that's bleak. Oh, you're so negative. Really? <laughs> No, you're right. Um, I've asked several guests on the show what's their relationship with death, usually through um, because of what they're doing, where they are, etc. Cetera, et cetera. One was a paediatric oncologist, another one was somebody who's a survival expert. They're both, you know, having spent an amount of time considering or being faced with the possibility and or has seen death. And yeah, I, I had a few comments about it in terms of, well, why do you want to go down that route? And and I think there is a bigger discussion to have. There are these awkward areas, death, what we're doing to the environment, 
um, you know, the impact of the um, uh, economy on our everyday life. And, and in that, there is sorrow because you can see the impact on it. And yet we shift away from it because we don't have, we don't necessarily have the information. We don't get, um, we get you know, messages saying that it's all okay or don't think about it. And all, and I think the biggest part is um, we don't sit well with negative emotions yeah. or painful emotions or negative energy. And if we can sit with that, face the darkness, like you said, then, then stuff can open up. Then we can have a probably more authentic relationship with nature. Uh, and with ourselves. And with ourselves yeah. through nature, death, etc., etc. Yeah. Et yeah. So there we go. If you could go back to a very early part in your year, say when you're about 20 years old, and you could go and give that Jan some sort of some sort of advice about how to handle the journey ahead. Um, what would that be? <laughs> My advice might have been find support or find the literature that's going to um, resonate with those things that I was feeling then. That would be able to support and guide me further because there was a big deviation in the meantime right yeah maybe i needed that deviation those deviations there you go yeah. to learn more stuff well, to, well along with what i was longing for at the time right and for the person out there who um wants to go and and feels very passionate about the environment and wants to go and do something what sort of advice would you give that person um, to get in touch with me yeah or, or get in touch with say if they like frogs in particular or reptiles in particular or whales to look up an organization close by to those mm. uh, to get in with kindred spirits or if they like getting to know trees finding out when the seed collecting is or when the tree planting season is or um, there's so much going on that is available but if you're stuck you could ring up any conservation council or any of the bigger organisations that are Googleable, Googleable nationally, internationally and certainly locally yeah. and there's also local groups who uh, a naturalist society for example and they've got meetings they've got fabulous guest speakers a join a diving club or so like underwater stuff is just so beautiful the life yeah. that's there as well so it depends on what someone's interests yeah. are and what I their capacities are work out what's the particular thing that you're passionate about within the big sphere, sphere yeah. of nature and, yeah. and then go with that yeah. and I encourage them enormously to do that and get the vibrations of beautiful feelings from yeah. that, that that last for ages Superb, superb. Now, if someone's listened to this and they want to get in touch in terms of wanting to talk to you more about um, your psychotherapy or if they're particularly interested in um, the workshops that you're putting together so they can go through an authentic yeah. connection with it, how do they find you? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, under uh, my website, jenrodder.com, or you could find me on a Facebook site which is Voiceless Jan Rodder. That's one where I am particularly for the animals who are voiceless. Right. And so with that, I, for example, go into my own silence every equinox and solstice. They're like the natural rhythms of the earth. So I'm available there. Superb. Yeah. Well, Jan, thank you very much for coming and talking to me today. Um, I think, as I said, one of the biggest some of the biggest things I've got out of talking to you today is just reconfirming my, what I already knew about my relationship with getting out of town, going into nature. Um, I think listening to you, I, I'm actually well due a trip out by myself or with my girlfriend. Um, but also it's the, despite the fact I do that, I'm still a, an active participant in the whole, Oh, I can't see what's going on in terms of the pollution and what have you. And I think that whole, you know, sitting with the uncomfortableness of that is that you know I am complicit in part of that you know I'm a consumer and and I am part of that and then learning to sit and be all right with that 
and and using that model to look at other things in my life. I think that's super valuable. So thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for coming and and talking to me. And thank you to the listeners. I'm pretty sure you'll have had got loads out of that. Jan, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Bryn. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Cheers.